This is Daniel King, and you're listening to George Fox Talks Wellness. Hello, it's good to have everyone back on our podcast and our YouTube channel. It's great for all the support that we're having. And today I'm really excited about the topic we're going to be um, sharing, which is going to be about mental health. And I think some of us or myself as a physical therapist really didn't um, understand mental health well. And as I started to go deeper into the understanding of wellness, I realized that wellness is not just physical health that we need to think about, but it's also mental health and spiritual health. And I wanted to learn more about it. And because of that curiosity, I try to look for people who might be able to help us in understanding um, mental health and maybe being able to define it, but also how they see it in their viewpoint as a psychologist, as a follower of Christ, as a leader, and what that might look like. And so I am so excited to introduce our guest today on the topic of mental health. His name is Dr. Dave Sambora. He is the executive dean of the wellness enterprise here at George Fox University, a psychologist and a leader in all things that are well. (laughs) Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I wanted to know if maybe, I mean, that's my intro and I, I, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing it justice. So mm. if there's anything else you may want to share, you know, about yourself, maybe not just from your CV, because people can look that up and you've been well decorated with that. But just kind of wanted maybe to share about who you are as a person as we start in this this topic of mental health. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, uh, again, thanks for having me. I consider it an honor to be here. I think maybe one of the first things that comes to mind is learner. Um you know, really early in my career, the idea was, um, how can I demonstrate what I know mm. to almost prove that I could be somebody who professes, a professor? Um, or maybe even how can I prove to God that I'm worthy of his love? And I think when I think about my growth as a person, it's realizing how much I don't know yeah. and how much comfort there is in recognizing that um, there's so much more room to grow. There's so much more room to learn. Um, And there truly has been comfort in that in Mm. these later stages of my career and these later stages of being a father and a husband. Um, I can't make it through a day without counting multiple mistakes I make. Mm. And there's some comfort in sort of knowing that that's part of being alive. That's part of being part of God's creation. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. And knowing you both professionally and personally, I, I see that. And it's really one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on to this podcast. So I'm just going to go right into the first question, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, Because that's kind of my style. Mm -hmm. Right. I like it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I think, are very confused about what mental health is because there's so much out there around it. Mm. I think a lot of people are thinking more about the disease process of like depression or anxiety or addiction. But is it okay if I just ask you, like, what's the definition right, of mental health? Yeah. No, it's not only okay, it's a great place to start. And and if you don't mind, actually, we'd love to even broaden the question to what is health. Mm. And, we, mm. and we start there. Yeah. Um, and in, in thinking about this, um, we as people historically have had multiple ways of defining what health is. One way that scientists tend to really like is statistically. Mm. And so when we take a look at statistics, we can see um, perhaps a trait like uh, blood pressure. And we know what the average blood pressure is. And most physicians would say, you're healthy if you're near that average. Mm -hmm. And then they would say, if you're way below that average or way above it, um, perhaps you're less healthy. Mm -hmm. And so statistics can help define for a culture what what is healthy in blood pressure. But that's not the only way we can define health. There's Mm -hmm. some more nuanced ways we define health. And one might be culture. Mm. So a culture, a group of people that all sort of have a similar identification, whether that be an ethnic identification or a spiritual identification or a status uh, identification, can come together and sort of have an agreed upon norm and that this Mm. norm is healthy Mm. and anything outside of that is not healthy. And then we can also talk about health in terms of distress. Mm. If it causes distress, 
a society might say that's not healthy. And if it causes comfort or calming, we could say that's healthy. Mm. The reason why I bring all of those up mm. is because the way that clinical psychology defines health is actually an amalgam of all three of those. Mm. Um, that there's a, a piece of it that takes into the science of t- statistics. There's a piece of it that takes into a cultural identification of what a cultural group or groups are saying is healthy or not. Mm. And then there's a piece of it that looks at distress. And perhaps that one might be the most prominent in the way that we understand health. Mm. And this applies specifically to health in general, but but I should say in general to health, but more specifically to mental health. Mm. And so when we talk about, oh, that experience of mental health is unhealthy, Mm. we're probably using a combination of all three of those. Each one of those actually has some strengths to it Mm -hmm. and some limitations. And let me just offer one challenge that we face Mm -hmm. in the world that I think all of us listeners out there could probably relate with is sometimes definitions of what is health change. Mm. And that can change statistically, but more likely it's gonna change culturally. Mm. And so that as society grows, changes, evolves, um, definitions of what was healthy may no longer be healthy, Mm. and definitions of what was unhealthy might become healthy. Mm. Um, And so I think that's a challenge for us anytime someone asks a question of what is mental health. Mm. But what I would say is uh, to to bring in the mental piece Mm -hmm. of what is mental health, we're talking about emotions, we're talking about cognition, Mm. we're talking about perspective, we're talking about basically a lot of brain functioning that over or oversee or rule over those contexts. So context of affect or emotion, the context of cognition, um, and then ultimately behavior that stems from that. Mm. So when I think about mental health, I think about those categories, behavior, cognition, and emotion primarily. So when we talk about what's healthy, is it healthy to have certain feelings, have certain cognitions or have certain behaviors? Yeah, no, I like that a lot. So if I can maybe touch on uh, or give an example. So what I hear you say, you brought up blood pressure. A lot of times when people don't understand cardiovascular health, they always talk to me about having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. You know, like and that's, you know, a c- accumulation of lots of things, right? That can happen. It could be diet, it could be exercise, it could be genetics. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I hear you saying about mental health. It's 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 a lot more involved than just uh, the disease or distress. Yeah. 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 And so I guess the next question then for you around that, and I loved how you put that all together is what is it then if you could have any markers of like, you know, for the marker for blood pressure is like knowing the normative values, right? Of blood pressure. If it's 120 over 60, you would say it's pretty healthy. What are some of the normative values or statistics that you think of when you start hearing or, um, have conversations with people about mental health? Is there any markers that you think of that would be helpful for us to kind of think about? Yeah, I think one of the markers that perhaps gets the most run in in my profession or the most play or the most value Mm. or most emphasis is distress. Mm. And distress measured probably in one of two ways, distress to the self or distress to those around us. It's very possible that the mental health experiences we're having are causing us distress. I'll give you an example, perhaps depression, Mm. perhaps anxiety, perhaps mania, Mm. perhaps uh, a schizophrenia or psychotic disorder can be causing us distress. And that distress could be emotional, it could be physical, could be ultimately resulting in social discomforts. Mm. Um, But there are some disorders and some struggles with mental health where perhaps a person has habituated it or gotten used to it Mm. so that it almost doesn't cause them much distress, but it causes distress to the people around them. Mm. And so both of those are things we want to take in mind. So when when I talk with somebody and they're wondering, hey, is what I'm dealing with... um, you know, a mental health disorder, mm-hmm. or or is it is it something that I should be worried about? Uh, and they maybe describe their experience to me. One of the things I'm listening for is distress. Mm-hmm. Is it causing them distress? But that's not the only thing. Is it causing the people around them distress? Let me give you a quick example. Yeah. So working with teenagers, um, and I, of course, was a teenager, and so I could talk <laughs> about my own experience here yeah. or experience of, of those that I know. Um, many times, uh, teenagers will be engaged in a behavior or an experience, and it feels normative to them. Mm. And you ask them, hey, well, how does that feel that you do that or that you're feeling that way? And they're like, I feel great about it. What's the problem? Mm. And, you know, let's say some type of substance abuse, Mm. Um, not just use, but substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And they might say, oh, well, you know, that that feels okay to me, Mm. or it actually makes me feel good. 
And so if we only looked at distress as a self variable, mm. we'd probably be left out in the dark then as whether or not that was actually some type of pathology or unhealth. Mm. But when we look at their substance abuse and its impact upon everyone around them, their school system, their parents, their siblings, their financial situation, whatever it might be, mm. that's where we might see the waves of distress coming. And so we have to hold both mm. if we're gonna correctly assess the the impact of whether something is, is mentally healthy or mentally unhealthy. So do you think then, as we continue to grow as an individual, from like a, from being like at you know like young kid to like an adolescence to now an adult that there's different stages of like distress and mental health issues do you think that do you think we change with that as we continue to grow as humans yeah. well i think something that that changes in us for sure is our self awareness so mm -hmm. when we're 6 uh, we don't have the brain capacities and structures to have as great of self-awareness as we are hopefully when we're 60. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing is true for other awareness. Those are things that develop over time from infancy on uh, that allow us to have a greater ascertainment of what might be healthy for us or not. And so you'll see parents having to help explain to a three-year-old, please don't touch the stove, it'll burn you mm -hmm. because they're not able to perhaps retain that information or they might be able to, uh, they might have a hard time sort of understanding that concept. So the parent has to get down and explain it. Mm. Hopefully by age 60, we're not having to explain that a stove is hot, right? Right. And so same things, same thing with mental health issues. So uh, depression might, a uh, seven, eight, nine year old who might be struggling with sadness might not understand the full impact mm. of that and might not be able to explain it, understand it, even tell a therapist about it. But as we get older, hopefully people are able to, you know, utilize words and concepts to be able to articulate that to them themselves and to, to those around them. And in some ways I mentioned therapy, that's that's a lot of what therapy is about, is helping people understand who they are yeah. and then understand who they are in relationship to others. Yeah, I don't like that. So I'm not an expert in depression, but I wanna just talk about it for a minute because I've seen this huge uh, awareness about depression. So when I was growing up in this um, late seventies, early eighties, I'm sure depression was around. Mm -hmm. Never heard anyone say to me that, they were depressed mm -hmm. or showed signs, but there was a lot of other s signs that were that depression was happening, right? Yeah. Yeah. But now, right, I have three three children in high school, and they seem to like know everything about depression, right? Mm. And they tell me, "Oh yeah, my friend's depressed," and all these things, and I, I just see a shift mm -hmm. in culture, right? And some and awareness is really important. Cultural awareness might be one thing. Self-awareness is another, right? Mm -hmm. Can you maybe speak into like why there's been such a shift or an awareness, which is I'm not criticizing good or bad, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. different, right? Yeah. Than the way that I kind of grew up and now mental health is a really big awareness issue. Yeah. Both self, I believe, and culturally. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a it's a wonderful question and and I appreciate your observation. Um, and, and to even add to it, uh, mental health has found its way into our, our cultural lexicons, right? So to hear a teenager say, oh, I'm so depressed, mm. or an adult for that matter, I'm so depressed, right? right. That that's, that's almost seen as a euphemism for lots of different experiences. It's, it's, it's uh, the, the stigma mm. uh, that historically has been around mental health mm. um, has been wiped away in many pockets of our society. Mm. I say many pockets because stigma is often attached to cultural subgroups. And so some subgroups have higher levels of stigma attached to mental health than others. And sometimes those are ethnic subgroups, sometimes their status in terms of SES or other types of subgroups may allow for a freer boundary or more permeable boundary in talking about mental health issues. Mm. But if I were to try and speak globally about Western civilization, which is so hard because there's right. so much specificity of culture in there. But in general, I think what you're saying is what I've experienced as well as a professional and personally that there has been an opening up of discussion mm. and of transparency around mental health. We see this in celebrities. We see this in religious situations, churches and synagogues and, and temples where there's a, a more open perspective mm. than maybe perhaps 30, 40 years ago when both you and I were kids to talking about these things. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, as, as a Christian, I attend a church and and I'll hear a pastor now talk a sermon or give mm -hmm. a sermon on a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, growing up, that was probably not a sermon that I would hear maybe ever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's in our social media now, it's in our news stories. 
And, and I would say that largely this is a wonderful um, sort of growth or development in mm-hmm. our communities is to reduce the stigma associated with talking about whether it's depression or any of the other mental health issues. There is some danger in it. And, and one of the dangers is it becomes almost so normal to talk about that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't scare us anymore in terms of mm-hmm. responding. So let me explain what I mean by that, that, mm-hmm. that if somebody says they're suicidal, one of the things I worry about is that we become so uh, habituated to that, that we, we don't jump to action. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we're like, oh yes, that was just another person saying that, almost like the, the little boy, little girl who cried wolf. Mm-hmm. And, and so while I greatly appreciate decreasing the stigma, what I want to keep high is our responsiveness mm. to mental health distress. And I don't want us to say, well, that's just normal, mm. right? And we go back to kind of definitions of what's normal. Um, the distress we're talking about for mental health issues is not helpful. It's it's not adaptive. And so we need to stay on high alert to try and address that when it shows up in our communities and our lives. Yeah, you know, and I think that you hit it on the nose because I see this happening a lot also in the news that they're playing this distress, right? And almost like um, trying to captivate people by um, showing only the, the, the underbelly. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is, is that I always, so I know you and both, you and I, just because of work, a lot of times we have to travel, right? Mm-hmm. So I always watch these videos and I watch these videos of these passengers getting really upset. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's so interesting to me because I just don't understand the distress when someone's, at, when someone, who's helping everyone else is asking you to do something and these people get angry and will actually get so angry that they will assault somebody in, in, in a, such a small confined area where being self-aware, knowing your surrounding, being respectful of that seems to me like such common sense, right? Mm. This is not just your airplane. You know, this is an airplane and you are literally like this, right? With your neighbor. And, and we're 30,000 feet in the air. That's right. And I think to myself about, you know, the, the commandment of like, you know, love your neighbor as thyself, right? Mm-hmm. Even if, even if, even if you're uncomfortable. And so I see anger, right? A lot when I see this distress in our country and, you know, I love our country. I'm just going to say straight out, right? I love it. But it's one of the things I get concerned about, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess with the mental health issue, you know, beyond the other things we've discussed, I was hoping that maybe you can talk about like, why do you think, or do you even think that anger is an issue, right? Yeah. In our country and, and why is that occurring, especially since there's been more cultural awareness? Is there not enough self-awareness or is there too much self-awareness mm. on what's going on? Uh, love love the question, Dan, and, and thanks for inviting me into that space. Um, when I think about anger, um, and I'm, I'm kind of smiling because I'm not avoiding the question. I'm, I'm kind of turning the question a little bit. Yeah. Um, in my clinical experience, um, anger is usually a signal for some other things. Mm. Um, and in certain cultural groups, I'll, I'll take uh, male, for example, mm. white male. And being a white male, I think I can speak a little bit more authoritatively about that. But um, that there might be more permission for expression of anger mm in society than maybe what's underneath it. Mm. And as a psychologist, some of the things that I think are underneath anger typically are hurt and fear. Mm. And even just personally with uh, taking some of my friends, for example, they would often say, yeah, I didn't have any examples of of white men in their lives who would express hurt or fear. And and that may or may not be true for other cultural subgroups. Mm. So I'm only speaking about white men because that's who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, that was always interesting to me growing up, mm-hmm. hearing that that was not their experience mm-hmm. of hearing hurt and fear. But anger, yeah, that seemed to be almost socially permissible mm. um, to share. And I just kind of wanted to say that, that when I talk about anger, what goes on in my mind mm-hmm. is a very complex um, combination of emotions. Mm-hmm. So anger that really might be fueled by hurt or fear. And mm-hmm. so I would just like to say that, and I'm not sure we necessarily need to go all the way down that path because your question was more about what's going on in society. And, and I'd like to come back to that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so it's, I guess my, my answer uh, starts with my frame of reference and my frame of reference is who we are as people. Mm. And that I believe that God created us. First of all, I believe that God created us to be in relationship mm. first with him 
and second, with each other. So I think about that as a vertical relationship mm. between us and God, and then a horizontal relationship between us and each other. Mm. And I believe that's true for all of us. That's mm. that's my belief. And that experience that you just described on the train is what I would call a relationship kind of out of whack, mm. right? Mm. That's not his intended plan for how we're to treat each other. Mm. And so then I ask myself, if that's not his intended plan, you know, what's going on with that? What's what's happening to us? Mm-hmm. And some of my thinking about the last few years and the rise of the incidents that you're talking about, mm-hmm. or at least I will say the rise of the media coverage, because I don't have that, that statistical data handy. Um, but what I would say is, um, we have been wired, hardwired by God to be in harmonious relationship. Mm-hmm. But some things get in the way of that. Mm-hmm. And first is when we have a tendency to focus on the self. When we tend to focus on the self, what ends up happening is we automatically start creating groups. Mm-hmm. And the first group we create is me and the other. Mm-hmm. And that leads to pronouns like us and them. Mm-hmm. And what's happening in society right now is a polarization anytime that we have groupings. Mm -hmm. So there are times where us and them historically might have been very harmonious. Mm -hmm. But right now in our society, us and them is not harmonious. It Mm -hmm. tends to be polarized. Mm -hmm. And there's so many reasons, sociopolitical and otherwise for that. I I know that's beyond the scope. But polarization is a theme Mm -hmm. in our our society right now. Mm -hmm. So again, if we have a focus on the self then it's very likely we're gonna have a sense of us and the other. Mm. And sometimes that's very developmentally appropriate. Mm. But taken too far, we can have very hard boundaries between our group and another group. And then one more thing that happens, and that is is that we start placing value. Mm -hmm. We start placing value on one group over another, almost creating a value hierarchy of mm-hmm. who has more worth and who has more value. Mm-hmm. And all it does is, all we need to do is take a stroll down history and see how this has played out between groups all over history, not just history of America, but the history of the human race. Yeah. So we have this place where we're at of taking us and people like us, putting us in one group, taking them, putting them in another group and now placing value. And what do we typically do? We place more value on the group we're in. Yeah. And so what we end up doing is we try and find ways of moving through society where we elevate ourselves Mm -hmm. to the detriment intentionally or unintentionally of others. So how does this have to do with the person on the plane being angry and and hitting someone, Mm. for example? Mm. Obviously, I can't analyze a particular situation without having a ton of data, but what I would say globally is that kind of behavior is a uh, domino behind a whole lot of other dominoes that have already fallen about focusing on the self to the detriment of others, Mm. a focus on the self that maybe excludes others, a focus on the self is more important than the other, Mm. a focus on the self that says, I have more humanity than someone else. Mm. And so I have more worth, more value, more dignity, and therefore I can strike another person because Mm -hmm. it reflects my belief that they're not as valuable or as worthwhile as I am. Mm. Why this is so out of whack is that's not God's view of us. Mm. God sees us all as valuable Mm. and worthwhile Mm -hmm. and doesn't rank us. Mm. That's the beauty of the God I believe in is he doesn't rank us. Mm. He doesn't say, Dan, because you're this way and this way, you have more worth Mm. than so-and-so. And And he doesn't say you have less worth. He says, I love you all, Mm. right? We joke as parents sometimes or, you know, with kids about, you know, which which kid they they wanna know, kids wanna know from their parents, do you love me more than my sibling, Mm. right? and, and that's ingrained in sort of the sense of us and them. Do you love me more than my sibling? Mm-hmm. And am I better than this person? Yeah. And God looks at us and says, no, I don't use that rubric. Yeah. In fact, I don't have a rubric. Mm. The rubric I have is, the equation I have is everyone equals everyone. Mm. It doesn't matter whether you're A, B, or C, I love you all the same. Mm. And so that's our departure. Mm. So then you add in stressors that we're going through as a society, trauma we're going through as a society. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'll save that for another podcast with someone else to get into all that. And and limited resources. And now we have an environment right, right for polarization, judgment, vindication, aggression, revenge, all sorts of these things that we're seeing mm-hmm. in society. And it's it's a it's a straying from what God originally intended. Yeah. You know, I think about the the 
the beginning of time, the beginning of what we know as time in the Bible, which is in Genesis, right? And what was intended is to live in union, yeah, right? And that separation happened was because of sin, right? And it's such a tragedy, right? I mean, if we think about it from that standpoint, and I see that kind of as you're sharing with us, right? What the intention was in the garden, and now where we're at as uh, you know people who have fallen away from that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as I think deeper about what you said is the fact that I would totally agree that um, we have, or a culture or myself, think about myself a little, probably a little bit too much, hmm. right? I mean, I'm just gonna put it out there, right? Hmm. It's like, yeah, you're right. You know, I don't like sitting in the middle of an airplane. <laughs> I'd rather <laughs> sit in the cargo area on the outside, right? Or the hmm. window, right? Hmm. I like to have an extra space, but when that does happen, you know, I. I think about all the things and the first thing I think about when I'm in an uncomfortable situation, and this might sound so silly, but as I think about my mom hmm. and I see, hear my mom's voice going like, son, like you think they're comfortable too? You yeah. know, like I hear her words of wisdom and trust me, I've gotten my share of correction. Right? <laughs> so I had some maladaptive behaviors, you know, <laughs> growing up as a kid. But my parents were there, especially my mom, to make sure that I I saw things in a different view. Hmm. And so anytime I'm in an uncomfortable situation, I really do hear this parenting, even at this age. And Mm -hmm. it kind of makes me chuckle, right? Because I should know better. But there are some times when I'm sleep deprived and I have stress and I'm irritated and I'm traveling that I think to myself, wow, you know, I'm really irritated. Yeah. Yeah. But I hear my mom's voice coming like, son, so is everyone else. And the best thing you can do is, you know, do something that can quiet yourself or give yourself peace, which a lot of times for me is looking at um, my phone and looking at photos of my kids Hmm. and my wife, you know, especially when it's in Hawaii. Right. So so if I'm looking at that, that just takes takes me to another place. Or it's maybe if I'm traveling to work, I think about the impact that the work we're doing this kingdom work Mm -hmm. is going to make when we're, when we get there. Right. So it's finding meaning beyond myself. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm trying to share. It's like, you're absolutely right. When I think about myself, it's going to probably be one of those, like, you're not putting that elbow on that, on that (laughs) armrest before me. Right. I'm thinking about that. Whereas like, if I'm, my focus is about the meaning of the things that are really important to me. Yeah. It doesn't matter who gets that, who gets that armrest really, you know, I'll, I'll endure it and figure that out. So I wanted to know from your viewpoint then, and you've shared a little bit about this and I think I've hinted around it. How does your faith like look at mental health or just health in general? Yeah. I mean, cause that's, you've opened it up. Right. And I love that. And we, you and I've already had this discussion earlier um, in our green room you know, <laughs> about, <laughs> about that mental health is a huge spectrum. Right. And yeah. we're, ne- we're we won't be able to, you know, touch on all those points. Right. Mm-hmm. And if someone thinks that's going to happen today, um, you're going to probably be disappointed, but, you know, we're being authentic and honest about that, right? Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to know, like, how is it your Christian viewpoint or just being a follower in your faith? Like, how does yeah. that see, how do you, how does that like lens, like craft the way you see life in health yeah. and then maybe in mental health? Yeah, I just love that question, Dan. And and I love your mom's words to you. Yeah. Um, and if she she wants uh, an adopted child that she wants to speak <laughs> wisdom to, I would love to line up and hear that because yeah. what she shared with you is actually part of, um, I think, my answer to your question. Mm. When she said to you, hey, Dan, do you, do you think they're happy? Mm. What she, she was either directly, implicitly, um, explicitly doing mm. was saying, Dan, think about the other. Yeah. And, and to me, that is Christ, mm-hmm. right? Um, and we see scripture replete with statements about consideration of others ahead of ourselves mm-hmm. or more than ourselves or more valuable than ourselves. It's the exact opposite of this phenomena we were just talking about, mm-hmm. which is, you know, protect yourself, look out for yourself mm-hmm. at all costs. Yeah. And Christ comes along and says, I got a different way. Mm-hmm. And the people around him, in my opinion, thought he was crazy. Yeah. Just like I think if he arrived today in 2021, we'd think he's crazy mm-hmm. because they'd have this message of, mm, Dan, maybe you should give up that aisle seat, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or Dave, maybe you should, uh, you know, 
give up some privilege mm -hmm. that you have, mm -hmm. um, or maybe generosity versus hoarding mm -hmm. uh, uh, finances mm -hmm. is really where you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of the time in, in our society today, when we hear a message like that, we think, oh, no, 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 because if I give this away, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pay for it. I, I will, it will cost me too many great things. Mm -hmm. And Christ's example was, uh, I'm going to one up my request of you guys to be generous to others, to think of others more. I I'm going to give up my life. Mm -hmm. And and so he said, I will show you exactly what thinking of others means. Mm -hmm. I will die on the cross. And so to me, that's a big part of how my faith interfaces with hopefully areas of my life that mm -hmm. I, I feel selfish about, or I feel mm -hmm. prideful about, or I feel like, you know, I need to kind of take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And your mom in her wisdom already knew all this. There's a whole bunch of literature out there by Joshua Hook, who's a hero of mine in terms of his writings on cultural humility. Mm -hmm. And he he talks extensively about this. And, and the truth of the matter is this concept of cultural humility, which is basically when I look at another people, another person, uh, by definition, that person is different than me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those differences are very obvious and very clear. And mm -hmm. sometimes they're subtle or maybe even invisible differences. Mm -hmm. But how can I attempt to understand who they are, empathize with who they are, and then ultimately care about who they are and care for them? Mm -hmm. That's a process of cultural humility. In some ways, your mom was walking you through that, mm -hmm. was a process of humility, mm -hmm. not just not thinking about you, but not thinking about you to the extent that you then can think about someone else and try and understand who they are. Mm -hmm. To me, this is the way of Christ. To me, this was his example with the Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly what she was about mm -hmm. at the well. Mm -hmm. And so he talked to her on her terms. He talked to her as if he knew her, which he did. Mm -hmm. And he spent time with her focused on who she was, mm -hmm. right? And Christ does this over and over again in his relationships with people in the gospel. He takes people where they're at and understands who they are at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I see the way that my, my faith sort of integrates with ultimately health and mental health mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. In the therapy I do or or in the life I hopefully try and lead, make plenty of mistakes, mm -hmm. is can I walk into relationships in a way that attempts to elevate the other? Mm -hmm. And gosh knows I've failed so many times in this. And mm -hmm. that's not a throwaway comment. That is a very truthful comment. Mm -hmm. I've failed more than I've succeeded at this. Mm -hmm. But is that so hopefully something I can work towards in my life? Mm -hmm. That with each passing year, I'm getting better at seeing how I can move through life mm -hmm. in a way that hopefully elevates all the way back to your question, how would that help me with mm -hmm. my mental health? Mm -hmm. Well, I would argue from a spiritual perspective, it puts me in alignment with God's calling in my life. Mm -hmm. And I leave God as the ultimate arbiter of what is healthy mm -hmm. over anything people have created, mm -hmm. over any system. And if I'm in true alignment yeah. with the gospel and I'm in true alignment with God mm -hmm. and I'm following his leading mm -hmm. in that, and by extension, therefore, lifting up others mm -hmm. over myself. God promises us mm -hmm. that he will fulfill us. Mm -hmm. God promises us that sense that his spirit will be joining us in that mission and fulfilling his kingdom. Mm -hmm. What better measure of health than to be aligned with the God of the universe, who, by the way, created me? Yeah. Wouldn't I want to trust his blueprint for my life yeah. since he created me? Yeah. So rather than going all psychological and talking about how benefiting others and pro, because so, there's a whole lot of literature on pro-social behavior, mm -hmm. how helping other people can help our own mood. Mm -hmm. That is something we know from science, mm -hmm. but it's something that before science, God told us about in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. You lift others up, I will bless you. That doesn't mean necessarily financially. It doesn't necessarily either mean that I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Following God, God does not promise happiness. He promises a sense that he will join us in that missional work. Yeah. And he will allow us to kind of experience that closeness with him yeah. as we execute the mission of Christ. Yeah. Oh, man. More than deep, man. I, I just so appreciate all of that. And the thing that that I think about when you're speaking about this whole conversation that we've had is and I want to know if you think what you think about this. Okay, yeah. is um, it's balance, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're saying we're talking about polar, being polarized, mm -hmm. right? And I think about being balanced, right? Uh, in in healthcare, we had uh, Dr. Sellers talk about homeostasis, mm -hmm. right? That's a real important thing for internal medicine. Mm -hmm. 
in psychology or in mental health? Do you have anything that like coins that term, right? Because I've heard like this closed mind, open mind, mm-hmm. and I'm not I'm not trying to step away from the faith thing. Sure. I just, you know, I'm just trying to bring it together, yeah, right? Yeah. And kind of thinking about it. It's like, is it balance or integration? I mean, what do you think about, like, if we were going to give steps to people yeah, and say that they are followers of Christ, right? I think we've given some, given some really great um, examples of that, yeah, you yeah. know? But if they're not followers of Christ, right? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I serve and I do these things, right? I have yeah. empathy, right? Because yeah. that's a big word right now. What are some of the strategies or thoughts that you would have? Or how, what would you coin it? Would you coin it open-minded? Would you coin it, you know, balanced? Would you call it homeostasis? What would you call that? Yeah. Right? Well, I love the word homeostasis. And and in some ways, if we, we, we took a look at our statistical assessment of what health is, yeah. homeostasis is, are you kind of close to the mean? Are you kind of close to the norm? So just a quick thought about that. So I, I love discussions about homeostasis. Yeah. But what I would say as a more direct answer to your question um, is, is a couple of thoughts I have. One is breathe. Now, mm. what do I mean by that? Mm. That when I think about that situation that you described the hypothetical on the plane yeah. or a countless number of interactions I might have in a day Mm. where um, I feel hurt or wounded Mm -hmm. or um, disrespected. Mm -hmm. Um, I I use those because those are things I hear a lot Mm. uh, in my day-to-day life that other people are experiencing Mm. as they walk through life. Mm. So I say breathe. And what do I mean by that? Take a pause. Mm. Reactivity. Mm -hmm right now in our climate is typically not helpful. Hmm. That first impulse reaction to feeling wounded, hurt, disrespected, um, demeaned, that first response typically will lead to other responses that are negative. Yeah. Uh, An example of this, somebody told me once, you know, sometimes when I feel really disrespected, I write an email back to that person and I don't send it. Yeah. That's what I mean by breathe. That's an example of breathing, like not reacting. Yeah. Uh, Another method I use is sleep. Mm -hmm. I go to bed. Hmm. I would say when I'm starting to get distressed and upset Mm -hmm. by the polarization going on in the world, Mm -hmm. sometimes I go to sleep knowing that Mm -hmm. when I wake up, there's a chance, sometimes a very good chance, I'll feel di- differently or I'll be able to think more comprehensively mm-hmm. about an issue mm-hmm. versus so narrowly. Yeah. Now, those are two very simple, but I think very practical tips yeah. I use to try and achieve this homeostasis, this sort of level experience where I'm not reacting good or bad yeah. uh, so strongly to the things that the world might be throwing at me. Yeah. But a little bit more complex of an answer is one uh, steeped in this idea of relationship. Hmm. Again, I return back to God's design for our lives. First to be in relationship with him hmm. and then to be in relationship with other. Even if one doesn't believe in the Christian God, one doesn't believe in the God I'm talking about, hmm. and I know some of our listeners would say they don't, um, the kind of articulation I'm making here about relationship is borne out in the psychological science literature. Mm. So whether we ascribe to the authority of God or we ascribe to the authority of science or some other authority, Mm -hmm. all roads point to the potential health-giving components of authentic, intimate relationships. Mm. And this is something that's become more and more clear to me with each decade of my life. Yeah. And and some of the listeners may know know me and and in my personal life, they would they would probably attest to this that that a pursuit of depth relationships mm-hmm. can an intentional pursuit of depth relationships can be such a support in times of distress, can be such a support when you're about to make a choice Mm -hmm. that could have big consequences, can Mm -hmm. be such a support when you're going through grief. And I can go down the list. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, well, how do you develop those? And you notice my word intentional. Mm -hmm. I I believe in my life, when I look back, there've been periods I wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. And then what did I, surprise, what did I find? I didn't have many deep relationships. Mm -hmm. What I would say, though, is is being intentional is only part of it. Mm. Being intentional followed by what? An other-oriented approach to relationships. Mm. Sometimes we can get into a relationship and we're focused on what the other can do for us, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times that can be a a characteristic of relationships. Mm. 
But how often do we go into a relationship and and fairly consistently, not always, but fairly consistently think, how am I going to be there for that person today? Mm-hmm. You know, I'll give you an example. So I'm going out to lunch with a friend. I might spend some time thinking, oh, I want to tell this friend about this and yeah. this. And I want to get their take on this. Yep. How much time do I actually spend thinking, hey, what's going on in Dan's life? Yeah. I want to ask him about this, 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 and this. Yeah. Because you and I have lunch together. And, and how, how often do I spend 20 minutes thinking about that? Yeah. 20 minutes, how about three minutes yeah. thinking about that? Yep. And maybe not having an agenda for me, mm-hmm. but having an agenda to be there for you, yeah. right? So I think about that as part of what's being intentional about relationships. I have found that most people, when you're able to do that mm-hmm. and say, hey, this isn't all gonna be about me, but mm-hmm. I want it to be about us and I want it to be about you. Mm-hmm. People really get excited about that. Yeah. The last thing I would say about relationships comes out of some work from uh, uh, Murray Bowen. And Murray Bowen talks about triangulation. And mm-hmm. what he talks about is he talks about how when you have two people talking like you and I are right now, yeah. it's actually really difficult for us to stay on topic mm-hmm. if the topic is us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, if I said, hey, Dan, how is our relationship right now? That's harder to talk about than if I said to you, hey, Dan, how about we talk about uh, this other person that we work with? Mm-hmm that's much more comfortable for us to talk about another person, whether that's good or bad, right? Right. Right. And that's a triangle that Murray Bowen talks about, right? Yeah. We have a triangle. We have a third thing we're talking about. Mm. Take two parents. Sometimes we might have parents who find it easier to talk about their children mm-hmm. than they do about their marriage, mm-hmm. right? Right. And so when I talk about intentionality in depth relationships, can we push through mm. the cultural and, and um, societal temptations that we have to not talk about each other, mm. but instead to talk about something that's outside of us. Yeah. I realize that's culturally bound appro- approach to relationships and that some listeners will think in my cultural zeitgeist, that would be inappropriate or even disrespectful. And I understand that. Yeah. And so all of our listeners would need to take this kind of information and filter it through their cultural lens. Mm-hmm. But as a, a large 30,000 foot discussion, can we approach each other in kindness to talk about how we are with each other? Mm. I come back again to Christ. Mm. Christ constantly did this. Mm-hmm. Let's face it, the Jewish people were enslaved at the time he was living. Yeah. And so, so as he moved, and he was a Jew, but as he moved through the Jewish circles, yeah. I would imagine a huge topic of conversation was, what's up with the Romans? Mm-hmm. I can't believe these centurions came in here and da 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 and I can't believe these taxes <laughs> we have to pay. And, right. and sometimes the conversation turned that way, but I would imagine many people wanted it to turn that way Mm -hmm. because they saw Jesus as somebody who would free them. Mm -hmm. But no, Jesus constantly said, essentially, I don't want to talk about Rome. Mm. I don't want to talk about Caesar. Give to Caesar what Caesar's. I don't want to talk about all that the Pharisees are doing. Let's talk about you, Zacchaeus. Mm. Let's talk about you. Let's Mm. talk about you and I. Mm. I'm going to come over to your house, Zacchaeus, Mm. to see you, Mm. right? And I'm not going to come over to talk about the Romans. I'm not going to talk about how, you know, we could blame your boss, the extra tax collector, yeah. right? And he constantly turned the conversation away from that triangle yeah. into the line of relationship, intentional relationships that I think yeah. ultimately in our personal lives can bring health to us mm. in times of distress. Yeah. You know, I think the challenge for me as you were sharing that is making time. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, being intentional means like making time. And it seems like so many of us are so busy I don't know what we're busy doing, <laughs> right? I mean, I know it's work and I know it's study and for us, you know, being professors, but as just as humans, right? I just feel like when you're saying that, I just felt this burden of like, but I don't have enough time yeah. to be intentional with people, right? Yeah. I might shoot them a text. And then once the text is done, I'm moving on to the next text yeah. or I'm moving on to the next email. I'm not spending multiple minutes even thinking about it. Yeah. And I would say that, I mean, I just think to myself, like, can I carve out more time to be intentional in those in those in-depth relationships? And I would say that the one area that seems to correlate with anything is the time I spend with God mm. in prayer and just studying his word and just being with him and yeah. listening. Yeah. Right. And as I start recognizing that, because you were sharing your faith, it's like I started not feeling uncomfortable. I was just like, yeah, Dave's right. Like, what is that? And I'm like, how is your prayer life? I started asking these questions mm. of like, not, I don't think it's self-awareness, but it's reflection. I'm reflecting and saying, 
what is it that I want to what, what what I want more of? What meaning do I want more of? Right. And I would say, yeah, I want deeper relationships with God, with others. Right. I want to be healthy. Yeah. I want to understand that. And I know this podcast is not just about me, mm-hmm. but it's made me think deeper. Yeah. You know, from having this conversation. And I think the greatest fear, and maybe some of our listeners feel this too, is this this fear of missing out. You know, known as FOMO, <laughs> right? So everyone's like, like I'm concerned that if I am going deep with others, serving others, not just thinking about myself, that I'm going to miss out. Mm-hmm. And there's a saying that someone said to me, that nice guys finish last. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I don't believe that. Yeah. I, do, I don't believe that, right? But I hear these things, and I think it's more cultural, and maybe it's just the, you know, an environment of like... And I'm not saying it's workplace. It's just the environment that I feel, right? Like I have to try to do something, you know? Yeah. And I try to fight against it. Yeah. And the way I fight against it is exactly what you said. I I spend time, more time in prayer. Mm. I try to find people who want to go deep. And I would say the third thing, which is, I think it wouldn't surprise too many people because they know I'm a physical therapist. I try to move. Yeah. Yeah. I try to like lift weights or walk on a treadmill. And it's not with bunch of people. It's usually kind of by myself because I'm working through something. And the last thing I do, <laughs> this is really silly because I hate doing this, is actually do the dishes. <laughs> and the reason why I do the dishes is because I feel like I'm serving my family. Yeah. But it's also taking a position of um, being a member instead of just being the leader. Like what one would say the leader. Yeah. I'm taking a servant leader um, place. And i I'm horrible at doing the dishes. I'm not good at it. I have no talent <laughs> around it. There's, I feel like I'm in a jacuzzi because there's water splashing everywhere, right? <laughs> but I do the dishes a lot. And I would say that my wife now understands it's kind of my place of like, I'm going to serve and I'm going to do something that I don't really like. But it takes me to a really good place mm. of just um, humility, but also a, a, a duty mm-hmm. of just serving, right? And doing. And there's something rhythmic about that yeah. that I really enjoy. Yeah. And um, it happens very often when I'm being stressed that I'll try to go and do the dishes or do like rake the leaves. I just take a break. And I always wonder, like, why am I doing that? Because I think if I don't, I think I will I will spend more time thinking about the reaction that I want to have mm. versus like walking away mm. and then coming back to the problem or the issue. And it seems like it becomes much clearer to me. Mm. So you've helped shine a light on lots of things that I used to think were really quirky about me. And you know, I always talk, I'm like, yeah, I'm a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> so if I get stressed out, I start doing dishes. This is a reason, you know, now I kind of understand why in my head. Well, I appreciate that you have just now made, made it much more hard for me in the Simbora household um, in the sense that <laughs> I'm sure as my wife listens to this, I will have an expectation of many more dishes to be washed. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah. So as, as we, um, I have one last question. Sure, sure. I can't I can't let you go with that without this, right? Is there a difference between self-reflection and self-actualization or mm-hmm. being too focused on self? So in physical therapy, um, or in I think in general in medicine, there's been a lot of narrative ther- narrative things that are happening. Mm-hmm. Narrative therapy, narrative styles, and also what's come out of it is just self-reflection. Like we reflect on each other. Yeah. And I think it's good. Right. I think it's good. But I wanted to know what your take was on it. Like, do you think that's good? And then what's the next thing after that? What do you think? Yeah. It's, you know, I just love these questions, uh, Dan. And and um, so thanks for that. It's tough because as a clinical psychologist, uh, self-reflection is the foundation of my profession. Mm. What business do we have as therapists going into the room to help others discover who they are yeah. if we have neglected um, the process of trying to understand who we are? Mm-hmm. And that process does not have an end point, right? So hopefully self-awareness for me increases over time, mm-hmm. right? So at one level, I would say self-awareness is critical for the success of folks in my discipline. And frankly, I would probably extend it's critical for the success of relationships. Mm-hmm. With that being said, I think your question is begging sort of a deeper look into, is there ever a problem with that though? Mm -hmm. And is it ever quote too much? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is yes, I think there is. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, uh, maybe a word like self-absorption 
brings about a connotation that it's too much. Mm -hmm. So self-awareness maybe on one end mm -hmm. and on the other end, self-absorption. Mm -hmm. And I would say in terms of cultural humility, a self-absorption place robs you of the ability, space, time, energy to focus on the other. Whereas self-reflection allows you a lens by which you understand the lens yeah. that you're looking at the other. Yeah. So for example, when, when a person looks at the world, they see it through a lens, mm -hmm. a lens of their cultural identifications. Mm -hmm. And self-awareness would help you understand what those cultural identifications are. Mm -hmm. And so when information comes through, you're able to say, okay, here's the information, but it goes through this lens, this filter, that's self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Self-absorption might be a situation where you're probably not aware you have a lens and you immediately accept everything that comes to you mm -hmm. as well, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm right? The way I see it mm -hmm. is the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I think it should be is the way it should be, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a little bit closer to this self-absorption where I can't see any other way than my way. Mm -hmm. Self-reflection allows me to go, okay, I see my way, mm -hmm. but before it gets to that lens, I at least know the lens. So maybe I can even analyze it before it comes to that lens. Like, what's it like for them? What's it like for their experience? What's, what's their view on this? Mm -hmm. Not Oh, their view is not mine, therefore it's bad. Again, it gets back to that polarization piece. Yeah. So I would I would warn myself mm -hmm. about straying too far on self self processing and self awareness. I would warn myself to kind of be careful to not turn that into self absorption. Yeah. For all those dangers. Yeah. No, I agree. I've I've seen some warning signs around um, maybe the direction we're going, some of the directions we're going with a little bit too much self awareness or self-reflection or self-absorption, like you said, um, about it. And so I'm kind of forming that. The last question I have for you mm. to wrap this up mm. um, is, can you speak a little bit about then collaboration and community? You've talked about relationships, mm -hmm. a vertical relationship, and then also a relationship with others. Yeah. And I, you know, I love talking about community or collaboration because I think there's so much power around that, right? Yeah. I mean, what's your, I guess the last question I have from you from a health standpoint, mental health issue or mental health, what is, what's your idea of like how to build community, yeah. um, build collaboration between healthcare providers, clients, patients, and just people around us, right? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, great question. Um, the, the power, going back to even your comment about, uh, fear of missing out, the FOMO, the energy, the ability to be intentional relationships is not um, created internally at a human level. Mm. It, it goes back to the fuel being the Lord. And so I was reflecting on how you said, um, you know, I need to kind of go back and check myself, like wh where is my relationship with the Lord and, and how is that fueling me? I think as we allow Christ to fuel us, we have those those bursts of energy to be so intentional, to mm -hmm. build relationship, and then to tie it into this question, to build community. Mm -hmm. Because community is more than one-on-one, -on -one, right? Christ had his community. He mm -hmm. had his community of three, right? Peter, James, and John, and then he extended that to 12. Mm -hmm. And then he had many others on that sort of peripheral level, Mary, Mary, right? Mm -hmm. And others who were a part of his ministry, but maybe weren't in that tightest community. Mm -hmm. So Christ was very clear with them mm -hmm. and clear with his example. I ain't doing this alone. Mm -hmm. Right. And some cultures I think are more prone to encourage a community mentality mm -hmm. than others. And so I recognize our listeners are coming from all different places. You yeah. and I are even coming from different places in terms of our cultural identities on whether that's maybe easy to achieve or encouraged by the culture around us. Yeah. But what you're raising is, is maybe we shouldn't be going this alone, Dave. And mm -hmm. I completely agree with you mm -hmm. that there is a need in our lives demonstrated by Christ to not go through this life alone, mm -hmm. that we will experience burdens. Is there time when being alone might be helpful? Yes, Christ did it, called 40 Days in the Desert, mm -hmm. right? Where he says, I need to recharge and I need to spend time with my father. Um, and you've kind of even spoken to that, mm -hmm. that we aren't worshiping community. We aren't worshiping relationships. We're worshiping God, right? The first relationship is the vertical one and mm -hmm. the other relationships stem from that. So building community is critical, I think, to addressing health in our lives and in particular mental health. Mm -hmm. And I will say it's tiring, right? It's mm -hmm. tiring mm -hmm. because of some of the things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're busy. 
Mm-hmm. And then it's tiring because it's in relationship that we can experience hurt, mm-hmm. right? Rejection, mm-hmm. right? Where we can get kind of pulled down instead of lifted up. Yeah. And I know our listeners you know, are on that page, right? Mm-hmm. When we talk to people about the greatest hurts in their life, almost always it's linked to a relationship or mm-hmm. relationships, mm-hmm. right? So I, I don't want to be naive in discussing the power of relationships with also recognizing the threat mm-hmm. of them. But again, I look to Christ as the example. Is there anyone who experienced more threat in relationship than Christ? Mm -hmm. No, he paid for it with his life, Mm -hmm. right? And so we can stand firm in our desire that he created that as our path to be in community with one another. Yes, we'll experience rejection, shame, hurt, Mm -hmm. you know, mistake, um, brokenness. Mm -hmm. But if that's his plan, I'm going to trust in that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Mm, Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've really loved the conversation. I'm so glad we touched on so many of these points today. And I hope that the listeners were blessed by hearing it. Mm. Well, it's been a blessing to be a part of it. So thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. This has been a production of George Fox Digital. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe to George Fox Talks on Apple, Spotify, or whatever you're streaming on. Check us out on the web at georgefox.edu slash talks, where we have videos, publications, and more. And we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash George Fox Talks.